Hey, General Dean, um, tell me about uh, how you got to be a collector of, uh, of military miniatures. I uh, first got some toy soldiers, Britons, mainly from my parents in about uh, 1946 at Christmas. They were marching out underneath the Christmas tree. Um, Grenadiers and Scots and uh, charging, charging Scots and a variety of those type of things and a couple of cannons. And that started me on this hobby, which I have done pretty well all my life, with the exception of uh, some foreign tours where I couldn't uh, add to the hobby because of the locations I was in. But um, over the years, um, they actually uh, became uh, new type figures, uh, which were more accurate, their equipment was uh, much more accurate, and the painting was much more accurate. So what you have here is a selection of different makers, of course. <clears throat> Starting at the top on this side, these figures I purchased in Argentina down in, uh, in um, Buenos Aires, and um, German First World War African troops. fighting for the Germans. And the figures that they're facing are Britons, uh, First World War type figures as well. Coming down. Coming down, you've got a selection of Britons, more modern day. And there is a very nice set of Arab figures. Um, Mainly, uh, they look to me like Jordanian figures. Um, and I bought that set in the British Army Museum. Uh, it was the only one I've, I, I saw that uh, really attracted my uh, attention just by the painting on the, on the headdress of the soldiers and in particular the um, saddle uh, blankets. And the rest are basically all Britons of different types. Rifles, grenadiers, Highlanders. Sailors. Sailors. And more Highlanders. Hey, tell me about this. Uh... Part of your collection. This part of the collection. Well, let's start at the top, Tony. You'll notice a big sign up there that says Beau Geste. That was the first movie my father took me to. Uh, Gary Cooper starred in, as one of the stars in it. Um, <clears throat> and it was about this. The family, uh, Cooper in particular, stole a diamond ring from his family. And he escaped and joined the Foreign Legion. Eventually, his brothers did. What you're looking at down here is the Mahdist Wars, which took place in the late 1800s in um, Sudan. And um, so you've got a mixture there of British. Uh, and these are a variety of makers in here. With the Sudanese in the patchwork uniforms attacking in at the uh, British forces and their allies. Okay, and what you're looking at here is 1870, the Franco-Prussian War. These are all the Prussians on parade marching by the, the, uh, the emperor and all his senior staff. And there are two makers here. One is in England, the other is in Spain. And the Spanish are the ones with a rather large square base on them. And, the, and what you have down here Tony is the Spanish Civil War. 
And these were all the various regiments that went and fought on Franco's side, along with the accompanying armored cars that they, uh, they used, both the rebels and the nationalists. You're looking at uh, Britain's figures, and they are um, Belgian grenadiers. And moving on, you're looking at some Russian figures. These are uh, figures depicting uh, Russia in uh, the revolutionary time. And then you're going on to ski troops and winter warfare troops made by Fusilier in, the Engl in England. And these are American-made productions from uh, the south part of the States. And more Britons, Lancers. And Dragoons. Now we hit an interesting bunch. Those are Britain's Russian figures. I had the Russian attaché to my home for dinner one night. And uh, he said, you have no Russian figures made in Russia. And I said, no, I don't. And he said, well, I will make sure that your Colonel Belzeal in Moscow knows about Steak's company and where he can go. And that's the Stalingrad train station. And there will be some boxes there for him. And this is my thanks for your invitation to dinner. And there they are. On the top level, uh, what you've got is a mixture of British and French. <clears throat> These figures are made by uh, tradition of London. And uh, they were about uh, one block away from the High Commission when I was stationed in London. So it was easy to walk down there and buy figures. The hard part was getting them back in the house without my wife spotting them. Again, what you have here is uh, First World War, uh, mainly the British lines with some artillery and um, some troops uh, obviously guarding those that were moving uh, guns around and moving the wounded out. Elastoline lineal figures. We're back into uh, World War I again. Uh, you can tell by the shape of the tanks, which were mainly made from tractors and uh, Germans and British facing off with one another. Uh, there is a tank in the background and the name on, on it is Buttercup. That was the name of my tank when I was in the regular force. And Tell me about uh, your relationship with Britons. Well, my relationship with Britons, of course, has started back uh, when I was a young child, uh, and I was given Britain's figures, and I had always maintained uh, some of my collection being Britain's. And <clears throat> while I was stationed in England, um, the, the guard's toy soldier shop was a big carrier of Britain's, and I had been over there buying some figures, and I ran into a fellow that um, was the Britain's representative, and we got talking, and uh, he said, oh, you've been buying Britain's that long, you must come to the uh, centennial of Britain's. So I was invited, it was held in the guard, Guards Museum, and um, there were 100 invitees, and Dennis Britton chaired the dinner. Now, Dennis was well on in years at this point in time, um, but he and I sat down and talked, and uh, uh, he presented me with uh, the queen sitting in her throne with all her implements. It was a very, very lovely way to celebrate my long association with Britain's toy soldiers. What you're looking at here, Tony, is uh, a, a large collection of Britons both old and new, um, particularly Lancers, because that's uh, one of the regiments that I was in, was a Lancer regiment um, many years ago. 
and the large figure in the back is a Royal Canadian Dragoon figure, about a 120 millimeter figure. And it was presented to outgoing commanding officers by the youngest soldier in the regiment. And that was one that I was given in 1984. They were made by tradition in London. Unfortunately, they don't do that figure anymore. And uh, I'm not sure what the the retiring commanding officer gets any more, but I was very thankful that I was able to receive that. At one time in the 50s and 60s, and I think into the 70s, uh, these were painted as part of a cottage industry. In other words, uh, Britons would uh, take the, the rough figure off and uh, at the start of the block in a little village, and it was mainly women that did this, uh, they would file the figures down and smooth them all out. The next house would do the base painting. The next house might do the swords or the horses. And it carried on like that around the town. And they had a deadline. The Britain's representative would come and pick these figures up, all nicely painted. And that's how the cottage industry for toy soldiers worked. What you're looking at right now, Tony, is um, lineal figures. These were made in Germany, and they're British guardsmen dressed in about a 1934-36 uniform. And um, they, uh, they are a, an excellent representative uh, that... Uh, Lineal put together. Lineal being a German company uh, that was in eastern Germany. It was closed down after the war. And what are they made out of? They, uh, they're, they're made out of uh, kaolin, which is what they made dolls' heads out of. So they're, if you get them wet, they will start to destroy uh, themselves. Um, if you fire BB guns at them like we did, they explode and blow apart. <laughs> Not a wise thing to do. What you're looking at from the top down is um, Lawrence of Arabia and his uh, bunch uh, attacking the Turks. Now the, uh, the Arabian bunch are made by a fellow in Texas. There is some Britons in there, but all the mounted figures are made by a fellow uh, that lives down in Texas. And he does an excellent job in painting them. And uh, they're a little smaller scale than the Turkish figures, but uh, that being aside, uh, they are a lovely representative of that period of the First World War. Are the Turkish figures uh, also from uh, Texas? No, no, they are, um, the Turkish figures are made uh, uh, in England, actually. Fantastic. Yep. Okay, so you've got an English square being attacked by the French, uh, cavalry and infantry, and you've got a mixture of makers in there. Um, they are um, mainly uh, Alimer figures, there is a tradition, mulberry miniatures, authenticast. There are some Russian figures in there. And uh, king and country and all the queen's men. So there's a real mixed bag of figures in there. At that portion of the Battle of Waterloo, you're going to see another one in a moment which includes the same kind of makers. And uh, it's because I ran out of space, so I had to do the, the, uh, the secondary group down below. And it gives you an idea of the scrapping that was going on. Hey, General. Um... These are uh, German World War II. 
They are, <clears throat> and they're a mixture of, of uh, makers. Uh, the, the ones that you're focusing in on now on the, on the base uh, are made by Elastolin, Lineal, and Hauser. Hauser was the supplier of the vehicles and the guns. Next to that, what you're looking at is a company that was in Spain. And they are mixed up, unfortunately, with Alimer. Uh, and they're not Alimer, but they have a similar base, but much thinner. And what you have a representative there is mainly Air Force. And the guys in brown were part of the German Air Force that went and fought in the Spanish Civil War. Uh, next, you have a parade of SS figures, again, Spanish made. And you get uh, the SS, and then you've got some Navy marching in behind them. You'll notice a large round device in the back. <clears throat> that, believe it or not, was given to German farmers who reached egg quotas. And that is one of my favorite pieces, the anti-aircraft gun, the 88, and the truck that hauls the 88 with the gun crews in it. Again, more 88 figures, or a gun, and uh, lineal elastoline figures servicing the guns. And once more, the 88 anti-aircraft gun with the searchlight in the back. Operational and, searchlight? Well, it would be if I put a battery in it and um, uh, serviced by the crews. Up top, you've got more artillery pieces, and they are a variety of different sizes, some of them older. But uh, the bigger ones were Second World War produced, or produced prior to the Second World War, but weapon systems that, that were used during the war. I joined Army Cadets in 1953 when I was 12 years old. You were supposed to be 14, but I was tall for my age. Nobody asked me how old I was, but I met the height standard. So in I went. And uh, I spent five years in Army Cadets and two years in the Reserves with the Irish Fusiliers. It was designated the 65th Light Anti-Aircraft, and we were equipped with these type guns that you see in this display, 40 millimeter Bofors anti-aircraft guns. Um, we didn't have all the sound ranging and uh, type devices that you see displayed there, we had the guns and uh, the ammunition. And we would go over to Fort Mary Hill in Victoria and fire. Now, the first time I fired a Bofors gun, I think I was about 13 or 14 years old. And uh, we would go every year with the reserve unit and go over and fire. There was a regular force unit called First Light Anti-Aircraft. They had 90 millimeter guns, and we would fire in conjunction with them. So that's how my military career started with the Irish Fusiliers. Um, in about 1957, we were reverted to infantry, and the Bofor guns were taken away, and uh, we carried on in our new role. It is, and 12 years living in Germany uh, gave me an opportunity to pick up a lot of this stuff, mainly because the figures with swastikas on them were banned, and I would go to a little country market and look for women who would have had children during the war and ask them if they had any war toys, 
and invariably they would have them covered up under a, a desk or a, under a table, and um, then they would uh, they would sell them to me at a very reasonable price because they had to get rid of them. They couldn't sell them uh, openly in a market. Now what you're seeing now is a mixture of elastiline lineal uh, personality figures. Um, I think I've got just about all of them. Um, again, you'll see the round base, you'll see the square base like you did in the parade. And there are some interesting figures here. Boring and Hess, Hitler, Mussolini, Franco of Spain, Joseph Goebbels, to name a few. Okay, those, <clears throat> those figures uh, were made um, especially for the Lord Strathcona's horse, and they represent various eras of the regiment and dress. And you'll see Second World War, First World War. There, you're looking at First World War, Boer War, Second World War tanks. That was peacekeeping. And there's peacekeeping. And that's officer's dress, but uh, has been around for a long time. Those are Hazar figures. And I never served in the Hazars, but I thought they were interesting looking figures. General, any last thoughts on uh, collecting? Um, yes. Um, do it for your pleasure. Don't do it with the fact that you think you're going to make huge amounts of money by selling your collection. That doesn't happen. And the best thing to do to my, my uh, uh, advice to you is collect what you like, what you see. They are a, a small work of art made by hand by somebody somewhere. I have enjoyed this. It still gives me pleasure. And in fact, today uh, I won some um, lineal figures at an auction. And uh, that made my day.